Hi everyone, welcome back to Socially Distant Tea Time. I'm Caitlin McGrath, founder of Be Her Village, and with me are the lovely Laura Otten and Evelyn Page, both licensed clinical social workers, both maternal mental health specialists, and both mothers quarantined at home with small children. <laughs> so we wear many hats in this little group, and our Socially Distant Tea Time started out of a need to talk about the realities of quarantine, the realities of quarantine as pregnant people and people with small kids and people working from home with small kids and they've made their little cameos. So welcome back and thanks both of you for being here. Yeah, thank you for yes, having us. Thanks, Caitlin. Always. I'm getting really good at that intro, don't you think? That was better. I'm glad, I like how you combined me and Evelyn because we are the same person in so many ways. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you can only say licensed clinical uh, licensed, licensed clinical social worker and maternal mental health specialist so many times. <laughs> See, you, you already hit your limit on that. Exactly. <laughs> so I don't know what week we're in anymore, but I was just saying to Evelyn before we signed on that they just announced schools are opening, playgrounds are opening. In my town, we just like, I probably everywhere actually, um, outdoor seating for restaurants open. So it's like socially a little less distant, it feels like. Things are reopening. And I, I wonder, we can talk about whatever you guys want to talk about, but I would imagine that there is, from maybe you guys can share what you're hearing from people, but I would imagine that there's like an interesting dynamic where even though the um, people in charge are telling us that we can open, that there's still a high level of anxiety about going back to this previous life because it was hammered so hard into us that if, if we get contact, people were Lysoling my neighbors, Lysoling their groceries and fighting about it and mm -hmm. whether they Lysol a banana and if it's safe, I mean, it's a whole, there, I think there was a, a necessary um, level of fear that needed to happen so that people would change their behavior. But now it feels like it's not so easy to just say, okay, go back to life. There's a huge amount of anxiety that goes along with that. So I don't know, are you guys feeling that yourselves? Are you hearing that in your sessions? Are you feeling a general theme of that for this week? Tell me all the things. I, I mean, absolutely, myself and everyone I'm working with and my friends and my family, we are all so ready to be done with it and it's not done. And when we see people who are acting like it's completely done, there's a mixture of envy because man, I wish I could just, go off, send my kids wherever, and, and go back to life as normal because we all miss it so much. But I mean, especially um, those who are pregnant and have new babies, but all of us as parents, now we have to figure out what we're comfortable with. And we have to navigate family that has different views of what mm -hmm. they're comfortable with. And if we're the over or under reacting and friends as well. And we're nervous about losing not losing friends, but being left out of things or, you know, being left out of family things or having to deal with that judgment or um, criticism of our choices. So now it's some excitement, but also a lot of anxiety about navigating that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it's, it's, I still have a lot of people who are still being very, very cautious because they have newborns, but also it's kind of like another realization of the things that they lost that they sort of envisioned for this postpartum time. Um, you know, even just from like going out, you know, putting the baby in a carrier and going out for a walk and realizing they don't want, you know, strangers coming up to them and um, getting so close to the baby, even if it is to comment on how cute they are and, you know, but at the same time kind of missing those like small interactions. Mm -hmm. So, so a lot of like reevaluating of like what I'm okay with, what I'm not okay with, and you know, and for all the people around us too. I have to, it's funny that you say that because I was never a germaphobe. I was never, I, you know, I, I don't know. I just, I'm still not. Um, but one of my absolute pet peeves that would make my rage flare up in my postpartum time was when like, it was always old people, nothing against the old people, but it was always like 75 plus year old, mostly women that would come up and touch my baby's face. And I would be like, excuse, 
excuse me, there's, you're not invited. And that was pre-coronavirus. So I can only imagine, um, in some ways, it's almost like better that there's this social distancing because newborns need a little socially distant contact anyway. Um, I was thinking also that one of the perks of this quarantine and pandemic that I'm really, really, really hoping stays because I would have killed for it when I had kids napping and like all these kids strapped in is curbside pickup. <laughs> it's because everything offering curbside pickup is amazing. Cause you know, when we were in, when we were growing up, it was like our parents could just leave, leave us in the car and run in. Right. And now we have this like hyper alert. Everybody attacks the mother. If they, God forbid, they leave their children for five minutes in the driveway. Um, there was like a, a case in Massapequa, which is near me. And this woman, I think she was the aunt of the children. She ran into the the grocery store or the gas station and somebody stole the car with the baby in it and the woman got arrested and I'm like how about how about the criminal that stole the car you know but everybody blames the mother the mother the mother so there's this dynamic where mothers can't leave kids unattended at all and you know but we don't have anybody meeting our needs so there is this curbside pickup thing that's happened that I think will benefit a lot of mothers but obviously we've paid a very high price <laughs> for <laughs> for that very, very small perk, for sure. But that does, I mean, you're touching on what from this, these three months that we've gone through and continue to go through, do we want to hold on to? And one of my, um, I was thinking of this yesterday, I was preparing for my workshop to, um, on Saturday about work-life balance. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had to really make a lot of changes from last time I did, because last time I did, there was no pandemic. And yeah. you sent your child off to daycare or childcare and you left for the office. But, um, so I've had to revamp it a lot. But one of the things um, I have on there is burnout. And how saying no is such a powerful form of self-care. And one that I, as someone who naturally wants to keep waves smooth and make everyone happy, uh, I'm a social worker and a therapist, you know, I had to learn how to say no, learn how to um, choose my battles with things, learn how not to um, let judgment kind of break me down as a mother. Uh, but on that, on the slide I did about saying no is about play dates and activities and, and playing with your kids all the time. And I kept it on there because as things are opening up, we want to remember what was good about having a schedule that wasn't a schedule. Mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. our kids responded in some positive ways maybe to a little downtime and about being bored and the benefits of being bored. Mm -hmm. What do we want to take with us into, into the future? Those are the types of things that I've been thinking about because we're, we were never a family that like over scheduled in terms of activities and stuff. I rarely signed my kids up for stuff because it was like, here's a few hundred dollars for us to stand on a field and you know, like we could have just done this. <laughs> For free. Yeah. We could have been bad at soccer for free. <laughs> we could pay you for it. Um, but there's definitely this thing that happens that when it's, it's not even so much that, but like for my kids, when they're not in school, our dynamic as a family is so much better because school is a huge stressor for my kids. I think partially, you know, they never went to daycare. I was always home with them. And so this leaving of the house and, and being subjected to rules and it's a lot of stimulation and, and they went to schools that were really well suited for them and the teachers were wonderful and you know it's not like it was the school's fault I think it's just school on its own is a really big thing and I'm a little hesitant about not hesitant I mean they have to go back to school it's not an option for us but I'm I'm like feeling a little nostalgic already for this like wonderful extended time that we've had together which I mean, at, it's like, talk to like late March Caitlin, and that was not what I was, call, not what I was calling it, you know? I was calling it something really different. But now that the fear of the pandemic is over, not, not over, but it feels like, I mean, I literally sat there and like thought my husband was gonna die, and I thought the medical system was gonna collapse, and like, I was watching Cuomo every day, and it was, it was really intense for a while there. So now that that has passed, and we still have this thing to contend with, but for me, my family was exposed, and the medical system didn't collapse, and it just feels a lot less, like, dangerous to me. Um, now, it, you know, we can focus on the things that were good that came out of it, and like, I don't know. I don't know anybody who hasn't had some sort of emotional transformation 
um, throughout this. I think it really forced everybody in a very uncomfortable way to face anxieties, to face patterns and dynamics. And like you said, Laura, I think those kinds of patterns and dynamics, it'll be interesting to see how they play out as, as families and friends, everybody figures out their comfort level. Because I have people in my life that are not socializing with anyone at all, who I would love to socialize with, but they will just, they're not comfortable with it. Um, so it's an interesting, like there's a certain measure of patience that I have to have, and I'm not a very patient person. Yeah, <laughs> and I, also, I, mean, I, I have a hard time not taking things personally too. And it, you know, it's not right or wrong. It's just like, even though I know intellectually that you're not socializing with us because of the pandemic, you know, it's a good, it's a pretty good excuse. It's hard not to take that personally. Right. It's like, you know, it's just hard. I think it's, it, I've noticed people just kind of starting to talk about that of like, how do I have these difficult conversations, you know, of, of you know, trying to read people and, you know, if they might be okay with sort of distancing at, you know, an outside location, but then they're like trying to pick up on cues that would might indicate would you be okay if I came over to your house and not just, you know, at the local park or things like that? And so if it seems like people are kind of gearing up to have more like direct conversations about things that they're uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. So, that, I mean, that's, that's come up in quite a few of my sessions as well. And it, it just like kind of the idea of like, well, I, I don't want to do this, but I am also not comfortable with, you know, whatever the situation is, like, you know, whatever level they're comfortable with, or like expressing like, I really don't want you to come to my house, even though I love you, but please like keep your distance. So that's been coming up a lot and just a lot of anxiety around having difficult conversations. Yeah, but I love how it, it is practice because we can apply that to so many other areas of our life of I'm going to respect what you're comfortable with and I'm going to express to you assertively, not passive aggressively, not aggressively, but in a way that makes it clear but respectful of what I'm comfortable with. And it goes both ways. So like for you, Caitlin, it's all right, you're, I'm comfortable and you're not. I'm going to show my friendship by respecting that you're comfortable and um, hearing that from you. And there's going to be things that you're not comfortable with that other people are. And I don't you know that there are, Laura, but <laughs> well, maybe for other people. about you and your assertiveness because you yeah. clearly communicate. And that's such a good thing because as parents, we need to always be practicing that. We're modeling for our children as well. And they're always watching us. And doesn't this apply to so many areas of parenting, whether you serve organic food or uh, fast food all the time, or what type of sunscreen do you apply on your kids? We've talked about that joke, you know, half jokingly, but these are parent decisions we have to make every day. Mm -hmm. And there are people who disagree with us every day. And <laughs> another theme of my sessions has been the toxicity of social media and Facebook groups, um, you know, with the social justice climate right now and um, just people um, attacking other people um, verbally and, and when is it appropriate and when is it not and um, just I think all of this is good practice for being a parent and, and all the challenges we're going to face to give and to show respect for ourselves and for other people. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're having a lot of I, I will say I'm having a lot of difficult conversations, particularly around sort of racial justice and systemic racism in our country. But, you know, yeah, it's all kind of skills around how, how do you communicate with people that, you know, have different uh, viewpoints. I'll leave it at that. I mean, I could go into more of that, but it's... Please feel free to go into it, Evelyn. <laughs> no, it's just exhausting. Um, and I'll say that I've had a lot of good conversations. I've had a lot of very difficult conversations. So I'm, uh, yeah, I think I'm at the point where, you know, they're, I'm ready to cut certain people out of my life because of the toxicity and um, particularly people not kind of understanding white privilege and how, <clears throat> excuse me, how their, their actions or lack of actions are impacting, um, like the whole movement and society, but also me personally. Um, so that's, it's, it's frustrating. It's kind of sad, you know, to kind of know that people aren't willing to do some of the work. Um, also just concerning that 
there are people who are mental health providers who are not um, open to learning. So that's a little just kind of scary. Um, you know, you know, it's my just kind of my personal feeling on it. You know, it's still that that's still kind of really very much present on my mind and in my house. So yeah, um, yeah. I've had conversations with pretty much everybody that I talk to, which is not as many people as you think, but in business and family and personal, it just comes up because you can't not talk about it at this point. There's been such a huge groundswell of support for Black Lives Matter, and there's been such a shift in the American public's conversation and viewpoint on it. You know, I think Black Lives Matter a month ago was a fringe group that that was radical or, you know, like it just was not considered to be the mainstream. And now it's like, if you're not supporting them, what is wrong with you? <laughs> like that's, you know? And I think that there's also been, there's definitely people who are married to police officers or are police officers or are supportive of law enforcement that, that have this like barrier of they think Black Lives Matter is, is like having the stance of Black Lives Matter attacks police officers. But I think at least my understanding of it is that we're all actually working towards the same goal. Cause they will say to me in these conversations, like, well, I think we should have community policing. I think we should have the police really integrated. And I'm like, that's what they want to do. Like, they want there to be a different vision of policing than what currently exists. And I think we're actually all talking about the same thing, but it's hard. Um, and not everybody, Evelyn, I'm not talking to people that are in your life, so I'm not trying to discount the frustrations that you're feeling. Um, but I think, especially on social media, that there's very little room for gray area. You know, everybody just shouts at each other and, and nobody's actually listening. And it's, it's really a hard place to have any kind of interaction. But um, in the, I belong to a few New York City teacher groups because my husband is a New York City teacher. And so I just like can get information about things that are happening with the union and, and vacation days and whatever. Um, and so there's been quite a few threads in there about what's going on. And the vast majority of the people there are completely supportive of what's happening and really awoken to, to all of the racial justice issues, but then there's some that are just really stubbornly not. And it's, and it's pretty alarming. Like some of the, the people who are trying to support social justice will message me and be like, you know, thank you for taking them on. It's really hard to do this myself. And it's, I'm surrounded by white people that I work with and these like, and it's awful because these poor, not poor meaning financially, although some of them, that's the case. These, these, children of color and black kids are being taught by <laughs> these, you know, white people that are not embracing um, some of the ideals of, or most of the ideals or any of the ideals of black life. So and I think really that's, difficult. yeah, I mean, it's really important to, to speak up and say something because at, at this point, my opinion is that silence is complicity with it. Like it's, it's not okay to just be silent and whether that's because you're not sure what to say or that you don't know the right terms to use, but we all, and even myself, I'm not like some, you know, expert on this, but you jump in and you're going to make mistakes where we all are, but we have to be willing to go there and learn and do the work ourselves and recognize, you know, all of our privilege, whatever that, whatever that is, um, you know, it, and yeah, I mean, just kind of being silent is not okay anymore. I, I love that. I love that it's no longer, because it was only white people who could be silent about it, um, to say like, oh, well, I don't, I don't want to get involved. Like, I don't want to ruffle feathers, but that is hurting. And, and to be able to see how silence and complicity is actually hurting people of color. It's not not hurting them, it is hurting them. Mm -hmm. I think that has been such a powerful message that's come out of this. Um, and I can say that for myself um, and for you know my family and some of my friends who it was, it, that was an acceptable response before it's no longer silence. And I'm so happy for that. And I've learned so much in the past, just in the past week. And my um, feed on my social media looks so different now, um, not you know cutting people out, but actually bringing people in to mm -hmm. educate myself and uh, to gain a greater understanding and checking myself when I have a strong reaction to something and exploring it. So all of this um, is such a great opportunity for growth um, 
and it's been exciting to see the changes. I'm from Richmond, Virginia, and you know, there's a Times article this morning about the Jefferson Davis statue was torn down, mm -hmm. um, and the Columbus statue was also torn down and thrown into a lake. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Um, and that's right where I, I live within walking, you know, my, my mom lives within walking distance of both of those statues. So it hits home and I'm, I feel very proud of some of the, the changes being made and the symbolism there. It's been really exciting to see. Yeah. I attended um, a march with my son on Sunday in my town, which was so cool that it was in my town and that, you know, the young people in our town were the people that um, organized it and they had teachers from the high school there and I don't know how much you guys have been following, but in Merrick, there was a protest. Mm -hmm. It's an embarrassment to all of Long Island as far as I'm concerned. The Merrick protests ended, with, or not ended, but things that occurred at the Mer Merrick protests were not you know, you hear the story that like protesters are turning violent, but it was actually the residents of Merrick that came out and were harassing and throwing things and calling horrible names, the people that were marching peacefully. And then, and you know, it's one of those things, it's like, you don't even have to agree, you know, like you can be an older person and not want to like, obviously it would be ideal if everybody could like, but you can at least just stay in your house if you don't support it. But they had to come out. And because they did that and just revealed themselves for what they are, the protests will then schedule the next day, the next day, the next day. And now it's like this flashpoint mm -hmm. of Merrick. Um, so that all occurred in the days leading up to my town, Farmingdale's uh, protests. And there was quite a bit of chatter on the Farmingdale moms groups about, you know, outside buses busing in people. It's the, the rumors are so ridiculous. Um, but it was actually a beautiful, beautiful event. I was so, I was in tears at one point because it was just so powerful to be walking and chanting and, and feeling the support of the people I was walking with, but also every intersection that was blocked off there were cars honking and pro and bless you in support of us and there were there was one cop car that actually was like riding up and down and supporting us and cheering us on and honking it was the whole thing was very beautiful and it was it was the opposite of what Merrick was <laughs> i was really proud mm -hmm. that Farmingdale, you know, it's not that every single person in Farmingdale is pro-Black Lives Matter, but that we could have a presence of like a thousand people marching and then plus all the neighbors and all the people on the streets supporting us. It was really a beautiful thing. So it's very, it like, it filled me with hope, you know, that there's, that there's good things coming out of all the pain that we've all been through in the past few months. Yeah. And I think it's important for people to remember too, like supporting the movement doesn't mean that you have to run out and do all the things and donate all the money and read every single book, you know, tonight, you know, there's, you know, even if you're taking, you know, small steps to, if it is just reading something on social media to educate yourself, you know, if you're not comfortable protesting for, a, you know, a myriad of reasons, I mean, obviously right now with um, COVID, you know, it may not, it may not be safe if you're, you know, immune compromised or something like that, or you just may not be comfortable yet going into a crowd, that doesn't mean that there aren't a ton of other things that you can be doing. You know, sometimes it is just having conversations with people and listening, um, reading, or just educating yourself or talking to your kids about it, you know, in an age appropriate way. There's like a million books to talk to kids about race and racism and being anti-racist. So it doesn't, I, I because I hear that from people that feeling like overwhelming of like, you know, there's like a list of, you know, 100 books I should read or like blogs I should follow or movies I should watch, you know, and it's, it's okay. It's overwhelming because if it just hasn't been part of your day to day, you know, it's just learning something new. So just kind of jumping in wherever, you know, if you, I always kind of was just thinking, talking to somebody, you know, if you're not, if reading, a, if sitting down and reading a book is not feasible because you have, you know, small kids, but you can watch a movie. There's like all these lists you can look up to of all these movies, you know, you know, after the kids go to bed or even if you watch, I mean, I watch movies in like segments because kids are around, but that's something that's still something that's kind of moving it forward. So it doesn't have to be everything. It doesn't have to be all or none. Absolutely. I think that's a great point for not just just podcasts. podcasts are great too. Yes, podcasts are great. <laughs> Um, and we're on, uh, by the way, we upload this to be her villages podcast every week. Yeah. I think your family all listen. 
<laughs> um, but it's, I think that's a great message, not just for the movement, but also just for everything related to parenthood, that there's this like yes. feeling of having to do all the things or nothing. And I'm, I'm a lot like that. I'm like, if I can't do something perfectly or I can't do something completely and throw myself into it, I won't do it at all. And I think that it's really counter productive for me and for most moms I think if we the effort means a lot and and it's kind of amazing what we can do um in little chunks of time I actually just had this conversation with um a local mom who I hired to help us out with some stuff on Be Her Village and she was so excited that I called her and I offered her the job and she said oh well I can I can only help you know a couple of hours every night after my kids go to bed and I said Laura you have no idea like that every single person that is on the Beater Village team, we all <laughs> do it two or three hours after our kids go to, you know, like it's, we're all quarantined with small children. A lot of the people on my team have full-time jobs doing other things. Like there's, it's incredible what a group of mothers can do or a group of women can do in those small moments. And so we shouldn't be discounting that and what can happen in bits and pieces. I had one client when I was a doula, she was so great. And she was talking about um, in her prenatal time, you know, when it was just her and her husband living their childless life, like she was really into yoga and really, you know, Laura was like, oh, tell me more about that. <laughs> she would do, you know, an hour of yoga practice every morning and she would meditate for 25 minutes and she had worked up to it and she had this great thing. And after her baby came, she was in one of our postpartum groups and it was like, I, I can't, do that anymore and I feel so disconnected and I feel so discouraged that I've lost that part of myself and I I just asked her I said what would it look like if you just did like five minutes of a yoga practice or you sat down and meditated for like a minute and a half just when you can you know and she was like huh like it literally sometimes it doesn't even occur to us that if we can't do the whole big thing that we want to do we could just do a little piece of it and it's still really valuable so mm -hmm. great so I apply so much right now I I was um, such a gym rat before this and, you know, the childcare and <laughs> I would spend as much as time as I could there. And then I tried to do the same thing here and was so disappointed because it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. And it was like, oh, I need to rethink this and scale it down and try something new. And that's another thing too, like becoming a parent, realizing like you're doing this for the first time. And that's a true for all parents, whether, you know, young kids end up because your kids never been that age before at that stage. So every stage is new for them. It's new for you. And you're going to try out different things. And what works for Caitlin or works for Evelyn doesn't work for me. And I need to figure out my own pattern and, and get ideas and get support, but uh, figure out the path for myself. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you guys so much for keeping this up. I hope that this becomes the socially close tea time when, when everything opens. And I do want to say, because it's related to that, so we canceled yesterday because I, I think I messaged you like one minute before we were supposed to start that my toddler had refused to nap, and that's a long story involving a stuffed cookie monster animal that <laughs> was lost and then so anyway long story but you all were like okay let's do it tomorrow let's reschedule and that was great but that's the truth of me you know my husband had to go into work yesterday and I had two kids and I couldn't do it all so mm -hmm. I had to say no and we rescheduled and the world didn't collapse or fall didn't apart. Collapse. any more than it has already collapsed and fall apart. <laughs> I didn't make or break it, but I, I say that to say like life happens and nothing's perfect and we have to adjust to it and be flexible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, for, um, there's power in saying no and we came up with another solution. Yeah, so. I should put on a t-shirt, saying no is self-care. Saying no is self-care. And my work-life balance workshop is this Saturday. Um, at nine o'clock and then I'm hosting the body image workshop again on Sunday because I have a few people reach out saying that they were interested and I'm not running the series again until the fall so so can they find that on therapyformotherhood.com nestingplaceli.com where where is I, that I would go to the nesting place because okay. that's where they would sign up I have information about it on my website therapy for motherhood but the nesting place um, would have the sign up information excellent awesome. right, thank well you. thank you ladies Thank you. We'll talk to you next time.